Okay, well, welcome everyone to the first ever Tennessee Turfgrass Tuesday. This is kind of a exciting moment for the UT Turf program. Um, you know, obviously 2020 has been kind of an interesting, unique year. And uh, we kind of got together as a team and thought, well, how can we continue to kind of meet the land grant mission and serve the, the turf grass industry uh, from a reach, research, teaching and extension perspective in these times. And this is the, the format we chose to do that. Uh, I'm lucky that today I've got the, the whole turf team here with me. Um, Dr. John Sorokin is here. Dr. Brandon Horvath is here. Dr. Tom Samples is here with beard, which is pretty awesome. And then my assistant, Greg Breeden, is here as well to help monitor some of the Q&A as, as well as my PhD student, Devin Carroll. So the, before we jump into kind of our, our subject matter for this morning, um, I kind of wanted to give an overview uh, of how these webinars will work in 2020. Uh, we will obviously meet on the first Tuesday of every month. And we will run from 11.30 to 12.30 Eastern. And we will have an array of topics throughout the 2020 calendar year. Today's topic will be on annual bluegrass control. Uh, and we will move into issues pertaining to sports field management, issues pertaining to uh, new zoysia grasses and zoysia grass establishment, to disease control, uh, to bloom muta. And then we'll conclude the year again uh, with a, a weed control talk. So we'll kind of bookend everything with weed control and have uh, an array of information uh, in the middle. And you will uh, be asked to sign up for each one of these webinars individually. And that becomes important from a uh, accreditation standpoint. There's a big need, uh, particularly in 2020, to have pesticide credits available uh with fewer in-person meetings and we are lucky that uh the state of tennessee is awarding one pesticide credit for live viewings of today's webinar uh the same is true for kentucky south carolina georgia mississippi and texas so for those of you listening from those states uh you will get a pesticide credit for your live participation today the way that that will work is that Zoom builds a roster, a roster of those who have pre-registered and then a roster of those who have attended. And what we'll do is we will cross-reference the pre-registration roster with the attendee roster, submit that to the states. That whole process should be taken care of uh, for you pretty seamlessly. I will let you know that Zoom as an attendee will track how long you are with us today uh, so simply clicking in and making that link live for five or 10 minutes will not be enough to get your points. You need to stay with us for the entirety of the broadcast uh, in order to get that. Zoom is tracking the time at which you are uh, engaged with uh, us today. This uh, webinar has also uh, been uh, awarded GCSAA continuing education units and I will share uh, that GCSAA code at the end of today's presentation. Uh, and it has also been awarded STMA continuing education credits uh, as well. So we have a lot of credits available. That'll be the case for the entirety of the year. Every one of the Tennessee Turfgrass Tuesday webinars uh, is going to have uh, pesticide credits and professional, um, professional continuing education credits assigned to it and we're, we're really excited to be able to offer that. I can see we've had a couple people raise their hands. Uh, we think that for today uh, the easiest way for you to do Q&A is through the chat box. Uh, we have folks monitoring the chat box so if you have questions, something you want to raise to the group, I would encourage you to type that into your chat box uh, and we will um, we will be able to answer those questions as uh, we go along. I can see one question came in right now, so we don't have to email at the end with our license number. 
Uh, to answer that question, you should not have to. When you registered for today's webinar, one of the questions on the registration page was, do you want pesticide credits? And then the other was, what is your license number? So you should have listed your license number upon registration, and that should take care uh, of getting that information to whatever state you are um, uh, interested in getting pesticide recertification from. I think that covers most of the mechanics. What I'd like to do now uh, is uh, kick it over to today's event sponsor, uh, and that is Dr. Jeff Marvin with uh, PBI Gordon. We'd like to thank Jeff uh, for his participation in this and support of this new initiative. Uh, and Jeff, take it away. Thanks, Jim. Let me uh, share a quick screen here with some news from PBI Gordon, but you know we're always happy to, to help support Tennessee, but moreover happy to help support the turf grass industry and and see information be uh, pushed out to the end users. So with that, I'll I'll take a couple of minutes and and run through a couple of introductions that we have. Uh, first one is going to be Vexus herbicide, and and this is a new active ingredient proprietary to, to PBI Gordon, uh, ALS chemistry, group two, safe on all, all, all grasses, cool and warm season, uh, post nut sedge and Kalinga control. Labeled rates, you can see there, uh, two applications per year, max single app is 4.3 pounds, and then you're uh, capped at 8.26 for the year. Available in two different sizes, the uh, two pound shaker can, something that you could carry around in a, in a golf utility vehicle with you if you see a, a spot on a tee box in a fairway that you want to treat real quick, or a 15 pound bag if you're looking to make a, a larger broadcast application through a spreader. And then also listed there, you can see the availability by cases per pallet. Uh, use sites, residential, ornamental, uh, institutional sites, sod production, and as we mentioned earlier, you know, safe on established cool and warm season grasses. So uh, St. Augustine, Bahia, some of the warm season grasses that typically show insensitivity to some of your herbicides, uh, this is safe. When you get up into the cool season grasses, uh, bent grass mowed at a half inch or higher is safe. We don't have a greens label uh, yet that's something that we may consider in the future, but right now it's gonna be half inch or, or higher. Uh, yellow nut sedge, so as we said, great on, on nut sedge and Kalinga control. Uh, here it is a month after application, you can see it there in the box, but uh, exceptional control on, on yellow nut sedge. False green Kalinga, this was a, a study that one of our researchers did in-house in Pennsylvania. You can see there a couple different dates. Uh, middle of July, really good control, 15th of September. Might be seeing a little bit of regrowth, but I think with Kalinga, that's the story that it's a multi-year program to uh, try and achieve control of that pest. Again, false green Kalinga at uh, New Jersey, two applications, but there on the right-hand side, you can see excellent control. So the next introduction we'd like to make is union fungicide. And this is a combination of size of famine, which is Segway, the uh, number one pythium product on the market, and azoxystrobin, another very good broad spectrum uh, fungicide. Frac codes 11 and 21, so you have two modes of action. Broad spectrum disease control, uh, pythium brown patch, anthracnose, leaf spot fairy ring, and, and many others on the label. You can see here a couple of the application rates and then how they correspond to the uh, particular AIs. If you're looking at the Segway rate, if you use a 2.9 fluid ounce of union, that's the low rate of Segway, and then the low rate of azoxystrobin, and then the high rate, 5.75, obviously you have the high rate of Segway and the high rate of azoxystrobin. And you can see down there at the bottom, uh, golf course uses, greens, tees, fairways, uh, lawns, residential, athletic fields, uh, fairgrounds, playgrounds, parks, et cetera. So a, a very nice option. And here's a couple of slides looking at 
uh, pentium control. This is a curative study in North Carolina, low rate, 2.9 fluid ounces there on the right, providing excellent control. Uh, preventative study again, North Carolina, non-treated. On the left, 2.9 low rate on a 14 day interval in the middle and then your high rate, 21 day interval, uh, providing excellent control. And uh, last but not least is pedigree fungicide. So this is a flutolinil uh, formulation, BRAC code two. This is a SC formulation. So it moves away from the uh, conventional WP that has been on the market. But again, your excellent fairy ring, brown patch, uh, rhizoctonia complex control. Uh, so with that, you know, again, just a, a thank you on behalf of PBI Gordon for the opportunity to, to help Tennessee, but beyond that, help bring new solutions and, and innovative solutions to the, the turf grass industry. So with that, I'll, I'll send it back to you, Jim. So Jeff, we had a couple of questions come in in chat while you were speaking. The first one is about use of Vexus. Does the turf have to be wet or can it be applied dry? Uh, great question. So when you look at the label for Vexus, we recommend you can make the application to wet or dry turf. Our recommendation is going to be to water in within 48 hours. Uh, we see both activity foliar and in the rhizosphere. So as long as you water in within 48 hours, uh, you're good. And then the second question was about use in ornamentals. Uh, currently, we don't have uses in ornamentals. It's going to be prohibited as a, I guess, an over the top if you're in an ornamental bed. Uh, obviously, the, the development of the, the AI, we did a lot of testing in and around ornamentals. Uh, so a you know, a little bit of carryover if you're making a, a broadcast spread along a, a plant bed and a little bit does drift into the bed. Uh, I don't have any concerns, but it would be an off-label use if you were to go over the top of ornamentals. Okay, well, thank you for that. We're going to switch gears away from Vexus. And again, thank you for your support as a sponsor of this, this program and this initiative. And I'm going to switch gears now and talk um, a little bit about one could argue my favorite weed uh, in annual bluegrass. And, you know, one of the things that made this a topic I wanted to share uh, is that it's been an unbelievable spring for annual bluegrass. I have worked uh, at UT since 2008, and typically we try to wrap up our annual bluegrass control research uh, by early April because weather conditions are such that we tend to lose pressure. And I have never seen as much annual bluegrass in May as I have in 2020. And some of our weather will tell the story as to why. So, you know, this is rainfall accumulation for Knoxville uh, in millimeters. And we can see 2020 in red, 2019 in gold and 2018 in green uh, for March and April. And our rainfall totals this spring uh, have been quite high. And then if we look at heat accumulation as measured by growing degree days uh, throughout March and April, 2020 would be the red line, 2019 would be the blue line, uh, and 2018 would be the gold line. We've been much cooler, particularly as we transitioned from March into April, we didn't accumulate uh, the typical increase in heat. And our warm season grasses have essentially kind of sat there and not really matured and come out of dormancy as the rate that they normally do. And the weather having been cool and wet has been ideal for uh, annual bluegrass. So what I'd like to do today is walk through uh, some of our annual bluegrass control research. I'm gonna give an overview of how these studies were set up and then kind of go on a plot by plot tour uh, to highlight some of the things that uh, you would see if you were at the research farm today. So. We're gonna start with POA control and fairways. Uh, this is a 48 treatment trial, three replications. It was conducted at three locations, one Montgomery Bell State Park Golf Course in Burns, uh, Jackson Country Club in Jackson, Tennessee, uh, and then the East Tennessee Ag Research and Education Center in Knoxville, and that's the site that we're gonna focus on today. This is a Tiffway uh, Bermuda grass fairway at a 0 0.6 height of cut, and it's non-overseeded. And 
we have tremendous pressure. Uh, our plot photos are going to look a lot like you see here. Uh, so what we've tried to do in these images, uh, Javier Vargas, who's a technician who works for me, took uh, really nice plot images. It was nice enough to black out the exterior of the plot. So you'll be able to see our five by five foot plot setup, as well as our non-treated strips along the edges. All of the photos were taken on April 18th of this year. So just a couple of weeks ago. So here is one of our first treatments to look at. This is going to be uh, an example of what we call a one-two punch program uh, for annual bluegrass control. So this would be a September application uh, of barricade followed by a monument application in March at the rate stated there. Uh, the concept of a one-two punch is essentially you make two applications. So this is one fall and one spring. Uh, and we can see our overall control here is uh, really good. Moving on, oh, I missed a plot. So this is uh, another one-two punch program. So this would be spectacle at six and a half ounces pre uh, in the autumn of 2019, followed by a revolver cleanup uh, at 17.4 ounces uh, in March. And again, uh, really nice response here. And then another example, a little bit of a different time domain. So this is Coastal. Uh, coastal is uh, a newer herbicide from SIPCAM. Uh, three active ingredients differing in mode of action. It contains prodiamine, simazine, and amazequin. Uh, this was applied uh, with metsulfuron September 3rd and October 24th. So our, our two punches, uh, so to speak, are a little bit uh, closer together, but it's still the same idea of uh, two shots uh, uh, trying to control annual bluegrass. And these one-two punch programs make a lot of sense from a resistance management standpoint. You think about if you have resistance to whatever pre-chemistry uh, you may have chosen, we can come back in with a different mode of action post and clean up uh, those surviving plants, hopefully not perpetuating that problem. And another kind of newer way where this could help um, is with biotype management. And what I mean by that is uh, my PhD student, Devin Carroll, uh, has really kind of dug into the literature about annual bluegrass biology and learned that we, we have some reason to believe there may be more perennial poa uh, in the South than once thought. Uh, you can see here, perennial poa is defined as having more of a creeping lateral growth habit where the annual biotype tends to be more upright. Uh, and you can see side by side here within the same uh, fairway, two distinctly different biotypes. And she's going to try to focus on that and understand why that occurs as part of her PhD program. But from an end user standpoint, we think about a one-two punch program being useful in that if we're only relying on a pre- and we have a plant that may be uh, perenniating in our turf, then that's not going to be affected. And if we have a one-two punch program where we have a pre followed by a post, uh, that conceptually at least would touch on both uh, of those biotypes. Another set of plots I want to I want to focus on are what I like to call zone defense plots. Uh, this is a screen capture of a, a blog post I wrote. Uh, last summer introducing this concept based on our trial work and much like in football a, a zone defense is when you take uh, players of different position groups to try to achieve a goal uh, in the herbicide world I like to think of this as herbicides of different mode of action groups put together to uh, try to achieve a goal and I'm going to show several examples of this in our field plot. So this is the first one. Uh, this is an application of Regal Star 2, 200 pounds per acre, applied on September 3rd of 2019. Uh, there are two uh, active ingredients in Regal Star. So that is a mixture of prodiamine and oxidiazon. Those are herbicides of different mode of action groups brought together to try to achieve a goal here. Another example would be freehand. So freehand is a mixture of um, pendimethalin and dimethetamine uh, together in a single application at 200 pounds. And we can see the annual bluegrass control from that application in October. And 
note the timing there that that October window is where we see freehand performance on POA be uh, the best. You know, you'd think with pendimethalin as one of the base treatments, it would slide more uh, seamlessly into a typical pre-timing. But after several years of testing, we found that this October window tends to perform best because the dimethetamide component can control juvenile seedling plants soon after they emerge, and then the pendimethalin will carry us the rest of the way. This treatment has picked up utility in Tennessee, uh, particularly around bentgrass putting greens where we have limited options of what we can spray uh, and there'd be some inherent level of safety should it move on to those surfaces. Another example of a, a really good zone defense program uh, is a mixture of katana and curb uh, applied in October. So here we have uh, katana at two and a half ounces plus curb at 30 fluid ounces applied October 24th. Uh, this is giving us really good control in the plot uh, that is uh, pictured here. And then most importantly, because we have two different modes of action, we've got some defense against resistance management. I'm sure there are uh, folks listening right now that have dealt with ALS resistant annual bluegrass, right? Katana is an ALS inhibitor. If we solely were to rely only on that, we would basically render that less effective over time. If we can put two modes of action together, uh, it's gonna help in preserving the activity of both of the tools. Now, timing is important with these zone defense mixtures. Um, I have a graduate student, Dallas Taylor, uh, pictured here, and she has been working on building a model to better understand when does annual bluegrass emerge in Bermuda grass in Tennessee? And what are the environmental factors that uh, trigger emergence? And I'm not gonna get into kind of the, the details of that work today. Rather, what I'd like to share is what we saw last year. Dallas's work involves essentially tracking annual bluegrass emergence every single week of the calendar year. So it, we can get a really uh, precise look of when uh, annual bluegrass emergence is happening. So in 2019, in Knoxville at least, we had our first documented annual bluegrass emergence in the 36th week of the year. So that would have been September 2nd through September 8th. Many of you listening across Tennessee remember how warm September was. There were jokes that August had 60 days last year because temperatures were so warm in September. And, you know, that may seem kind of counterintuitive that we had annual bluegrass emergence during that time period. But I think one of the things that we forget is that, you know, we may have had days where the temperature was in the 90s at the, at the peak of the day. But many of those days from midnight to, say, nine in the morning had temperatures below 70. And we ramped up as we went through the day. But that cooling in the morning was still enough to trigger uh, some initial annual bluegrass seed to germinate uh, at our test site. Our fall flush of annual bluegrass occurred between weeks 42 uh, and 46. So this is October 14th through November 17th. And this has aligned with our uh, optimal control window. Since we've been doing these uh, statewide trials, we have seen that that kind of late October, early November window is uh, kind of the best time in, to address annual bluegrass issues in Tennessee. And we think that, you know, timing the implementation of a control measure with this flush uh, tends to make, make a lot of good sense. This is a plot uh, of a, a treatment that debuted uh, in the 2019 POA season. So this is spectacle uh, at six and a half ounces plus tribute uh, at one ounce plus princep at 32 ounces. This was applied November 19th. So this would have been right at the end uh, of that kind of flush cycle. So we've, we've really gotten the bulk of our annual bluegrass to come up. The princep and the tribute total can, can, can uh, control those newly emerged seedlings. And then the spectacle can provide us residual to move uh, throughout the rest of the season. Now you may wonder in the middle of that plot that doesn't look a uh, hundred percent clean. Those plants that you see there, um, they are not POA. 
that is an emergence of uh, Nuts Edge and Kalinga that has come into that plot uh, throughout the springtime. The site that we have this work at uh, has a history of infestation there as well as POA um, in the same location. Here's another example uh, of a uh, three-way mixture program. So this is Monument at 0.53 ounces plus Barricade plus Princep applied on the same date, November 19th. You can see on April 18th, 2020, uh, doing a nice job on our annual bluegrass at this location. I'm gonna segue into our dormancy timings now. You know, the zone defense concept is really uh, where we are pushing folks to go uh, when they think about controlling POA is a, a zone defense approach. Uh, slated for uh, the fall in that week 42 to 46 window, but I know uh, many listening like to apply during dormancy. Here's a look at how some of those treatments in dormancy performed this year. So this is Roundup at 32 ounces plus Ronstar at 121 ounces applied on February 14th. Uh, again, when we have susceptible annual bluegrass, this treatment does a nice job. One of the problems that we see across the state is it's been used so readily for so long, we're losing that susceptibility in certain locations. Those who have struggled with uh, resistance issues in glyphosate, one of the, the logical rotations or changes is to move into glufosinate. Uh, for a long time, the only glufosinate product in the industry uh, was Finale. Uh, this plot you see pictured is Finale at six quarts per acre uh, applied on February 14th. And overall control here, uh, really good. One of the, the lessons with Finale that we like to talk about is that it is a contact herbicide. It is not readily translocated. And because of that, we really can't cut rate. Uh, I know that there is a tendency, particularly if you've been relying on, say, Roundup exclusively, when we move into a different product, the price point can change, and there's um, some, some effect of that on what rate we can use of what's the new alternative selected. And I know plenty that have used Finale at rates lower than six quarts, and they, they tend to see regrowth uh, from that. So if you are going to make the investment in a uh, glufosinate program, it really needs to be at the maximum label rate to prevent uh, the idea that you're going to get some regrowth. Uh, Cheetah Pro, so this was a new uh, Finale product from New Farm, excuse me, a new glufosinate product uh, from New Farm uh, that debuted in the industry uh, in 2020. So this would be 82 fluid ounces of Cheetah Pro. That is the equivalent glufosinate load to a six-quart uh, rate of finale. And that was a, that was a talking point throughout the winter uh, that a lot, most of the glufosinate literature out there in turf grass is all based off the finale rate structure. The concentration of uh, glufosinate in Cheetah Pro is different from finale. And it's one of the reasons the rates from one product to the other uh, are not transferable. This is another new farm product applied in dormancy. Uh, this is SureGuard at 12 fluid ounces, applied February 14th. SureGuard is a PPO inhibitor. It really needs to go on dormant turf in order to have the best uh, utility. And we can see control here from that SureGuard treatment uh, in this one plot uh, moving along quite well. Now, Timing is going to matter here too. We talked about timing in the fall in with respect to zone defenses uh, working well in October, November. Here's a zone defense concept applied at the wrong timing. So this would be Katana at two and a half ounces plus Exonerate at six fluid ounces applied in February. And conditions in February are not going to be optimal for either Katana or Exonerate to do what they want them to do from a POA control standpoint. And the photo here is evidence of that. If we take that same treatment and we put it out at an optimal timing, we're gonna get a very different response here. So this is that same Katana plus Exonerate treatment. This was applied on March 16th of 2020 and night and day difference in terms of our annual bluegrass control. 
So you really need to think through this, that if you're going to take this zone defense idea and put it into play, we need to do it when environmental conditions are right for uh, the herbicides that we are interested in working with. This is one other uh, zone defense concept. And again, you'll see here, these are all March applications. This is Monument plus Princep in March. We have moved past recommending standalone treatments in spring uh, on fairways. Right now, as a, a, through UT Extension, we are recommending mixtures. The zone defense concepts uh, in mixture, uh, again, perform well when used at optimal timings. So looking, you know, I mentioned in the beginning um, that what I was showing was uh, plots from a 48 treatment trial that was conducted across three locations. And what you see in this table, so these are herbicide treatments that were in the top statistical category at all three of those locations. And what you can take from this is that they're all zone defenses, right? They're all mixtures of uh, different herbicides varying in mode of action applied in an array of timings to do what we want to do from a annual bluegrass control standpoint. Now, I want to segue into greens. Uh, there's been several questions that have come up um, that I can touch on. I'm going to scroll back here a little bit and run through some of these questions. Um, one of the questions came in, are GDD data and graphs available on a public website? Uh, so the website that you registered for this webinar on, um, is TennesseeTurfGrassWeeds.org, we have a climate data page uh, that was put together by our colleagues at measure.io. Uh, and they will give us some baseline information about GDD, moisture, and temperature uh, I think for eight different Tennessee locations, and they can be really useful with uh, decision making. And we have a question here regarding perennial poa and the use of pre's. Are perennial poa plants evident at the time of pre emergence application? Uh, we are not sure yet. Uh, obviously, if we define perennial, uh, they, they should be. One of our working hypotheses is that we could have biotypes of poa that respond much like poa trivialis in tall fescue lawns, that we see them in the spring when conditions are favorable, then in the summer as temperatures warm, they kind of fade away. Uh, and as we get back in the fall, we see that poa trivialis again. So thinking about potentially having that with poa annua is certainly interesting and will prevent per, uh, pose some new uh, management challenges moving forward. So let's, let's talk about greens uh, in the time that we have left in today's webinar. Um, I skipped a slide. We looked this year at uh, 21 different treatments uh, for poa control and ultra growth Bermuda grass greens. Um, that's obviously a, an area of interest for golf course superintendents. And that is a, a group of the industry that we work to serve. It's also where we see widespread resistance issues, uh, particularly with the ALS inhibitors. And it's also where we have the fewest options in terms of what's labeled and what we can and cannot do to try to control annual bluegrass in their surfaces. This work was done uh, much like the fairway work at the East Tennessee Ag Research and Education Center. It was on a newer cultivar of ultra dwarf Bermuda grass. Uh, the name of that cultivar is Mach 1. Uh, our height of cut in season was 125. Uh, during dormancy, it was raised to 200. We used winter protective covers when our uh, temperatures were forecasted to be less than or equal to 25. And the site was on a preventative fungicide program uh, throughout the duration of the year. Our setup here is gonna be real similar uh, to the fairway site. Uh, again, we're gonna go plot by plot and talk about um, some key treatments of interest. Uh, you'll see within each image, we've tried to black out uh, some of the areas that aren't really relevant to the plot that we're discussing. Uh, you'll probably see more distinctly in these putting green plots, the uh, paint that we use to dot the corners uh, of our trials. And we wanna focus as we did in the fairway in the center of each plot, because we try to leave the exterior left-hand and right-hand edges 
uh, as non-treated strips. So this would be a plot that's five foot wide and we only sprayed uh, the four feet uh, along the center. This is a photo from April 18th, again captured by Javier Vargas. Uh, and we can see within our Mach 1 as we're coming out of dormancy, uh, pretty sufficient uh, annual bluegrass pressure in order to assess the efficacy of different treatments. So when we think about the ultra dwarfs in a world where we have ALS resistance, uh, one of the things we've seen the industry move to is curb and curb in different use patterns and active ingredient loads. Um, this is a program that did really well for us in uh, the 2018, 2019 POA season. So this was two applications of curb. This is the liquid formulation of curb, the SC uh, at 10 fluid ounces per acre one in October and one in November. And this has done a fairly good job here in April, keeping our um, POA pressure at bay. This would be the same uh, treatment structure in terms of when we're gonna make our applications. This is October 24th for our initial and then a sequential on November 18th. Uh, but we've increased our curb rate here uh, to 15 fluid ounces per acre. So uh, instead of a two-shot program to get us to 20 ounces, here we have a two-shot program to get us to 30 ounces. And over the course of uh, all of our trial work this year, we saw that 30 ounces performed better uh, than 20 ounces. And there, there's going to be a different ways you can get to 30, but getting to 30 ounces of curb uh, gave us better annual bluegrass control than 20 across the trials that we uh, conducted in the 2019-2020 uh, POA season. Here's another approach of getting to 30, and this is not a program that's uh, commonly used in Tennessee as far as I understand, but I know in points southward uh, as we get into areas of Georgia, and I know we have folks in Georgia listening today because we have uh, Georgia pesticide credits available for today's session. Um, this is a common program in Georgia. I know superintendents in Savannah that use this regularly. Uh, curb at 10 ounces. Uh, initial application October 24th. Then we come back November 18th. And then we come back again December 16th. So we're, we're basically putting four weeks in between these shots of curb to get us to that 30 ounce rate. And you may wonder, why do we have to dice it up like this? Why can't we make one application and come in and, and drop the hammer, so to speak? And one of the issues with that is we can get curb injury on the ultra dwarfs. It's a root absorbed product and we can see curb injury on the ultra dwarfs when rates become too high. And one of the issues with greens that we really have to mitigate is the potential for overlapping. So you may think, well, if I had uh, 30 ounces is the number I want to get to. Why don't I make a 30 ounce application once and be done with it? Well, if I have overlaps in my spray pattern at 30 ounces, well, now I'm going to have streaks where the turf essentially got 60 ounces a curb, which is two times what I would want. And that's going to be a very visible uh, injury scar. So one of the reasons of getting at this 30 ounce uh, target with kind of a stagger step approach is to mitigate some of the injury issues that can happen when curb rates become excessive. This is one shot of curb at 20 ounces, but applied later. So this is November 18th, uh, curb at 20 ounces. We can see overall uh, fairly good in the center of the plot here though. Uh, we do have a couple of straggling plants uh, left behind. Uh, again, speaking to that general trend of 30 ounces tending to outperform 20. Now, we talked about katana and curb uh, in the fairway, and we're gonna talk about it here on an ultra dwarf green as well. And one of the reasons this is really, really important is that we've seen adoption of curb on a wide scale in large part because of ALS resistance issues. And one of the things that I know gives uh, myself as a weed scientist and my colleagues in weed scientists, weed science, some heartburn throughout the Southeast is that we see movement into curb and then we're worried that we're going to just select for more curb resistance down the road if we have just exclusive use of curb. We already have 
uh, a documented case of curb resistance in Georgia. My colleague, Dr. McCullough in Georgia documented that a couple years ago. And we think as use has picked up uh, with curb on the ultra dwarfs, we're gonna see that increase and that's not a good thing. So here's an example of that zone defense concept. So this is Katana at two and a half ounces plus curb at 20 ounces one application on November 18th. And this is giving us equivalent control to what we had with those 30 ounce programs of curb alone, kind of stagger stepped uh, throughout the fall. So from an efficiency standpoint, if we go with a zone defense concept and we take something like Katana and we put it with curb, now we don't have to make as many applications. And then the other thing we can do is we can get by with uh, a lower rate of curb so we can mitigate some injury risk that this is giving us with a mixture of katana plus curb at 20 ounces equivalent control to what a 30 ounce curb program would give us if used alone. Had some questions last summer about some of our PGRs and could we kind of mirroring what's done uh, on bent grass putting greens could we use PGRs to try to uh, shift the balance to competition and discourage annual bluegrass in our ultra dwarfs, particularly with PGR applications in springtime. One of the PGRs we looked at this year was a new. Uh, this is a single application of a new uh, at 16 ounces per acre applied on March 6th, photo April 18th. We can see a little bit of discoloration to our Mach 1 Bermuda grass from this app, but not, not too bad. Uh, but the takeaway here is we're not seeing any sort of annual bluegrass control that we would want from uh, a prohexidione application in a new. This was a learning experience for me. Um, and I shared this on Twitter because I was so uh, kind of blown away by it. The rationale was, well, what if we use trim it as a PGR on ultra dwarfs, right? And we could make the application when the turf was still dormant and maybe that would make some headway on annual bluegrass and be something that we could incorporate into a management program. And I think you can conclusively say from this photo that that is not something we would recommend you do. Um, we saw from this substantial uh, delays in green up. These plots are still, uh, as of today's broadcast, have not fully greened up uh, out of winter dormancy from this 32 ounce uh, application of trimment made on March 6th, and this is certainly something uh, we would discourage. And, and trimment, again, is a root absorbed product. Uh, pro we want to shy away from this on the ultra dwarfs as we're transitioning out of dormancy. Uh, not enough um, level of comfort by any means to be something that we would want to consider uh, moving forward. And then the, the last uh, plot photo I'm going to share before we take questions is, is Benzamec. Uh, this is, again is a herbicide that really kind of is, is been used most commonly on bentgrass putting greens for POA management at uh, nine fluid ounces per thousand. Haven't really seen much use of this on the ultra dwarfs during my time in Tennessee. And this was kind of a first look for us. Um, this was an application applied October 24th, 2019. In this one picture, we see uh, pretty decent control as we, we got into uh, some of our other replications here. You know, one of the things we're doing today is we're only looking at individual plots. Uh, we're not looking at all four reps of every uh, treatment that is being featured. Uh, we did see some variability when we had environments of higher pressure where the control with Benzamec as a standalone treatment is lower. However, I share this because it is certainly something of interest to me in that it introduces a new, uh, or excuse me, a different or a not commonly used mode of action um, to kind of our control matrix on the ultra dwarfs. And it seems like it would be a logical tank mix partner uh, for a number of different herbicides, be they ALS inhibitors, be they CURB, be they ALS inhibitors plus CURB put together, um, that we could introduce a different mode of action and get some extended residual control. So I think that this is something that we're gonna look more at in the 2020, uh, 2021 POA season. So kind of final thoughts on everything before we, we wrap questions here and sign off. Um, you know, going to fairways conclusively now and, and this season was no different than years prior in that late fall mixtures tend to be our best option 
for when to control POA uh, in Tennessee. You know, I've gotten several questions this spring about what could be sprayed now. And, and the reality is that it's pretty limited, particularly if you live in a world where you have uh, ALS resistance. So revolver and monument and katana aren't working for you. Um, we have pretty limited options of what we can do uh, post-emergence in springtime. We think about that late fall window, that's where we have our greatest diversity of options. We can put them together in that zone defense concept uh, and really get uh, pretty good results over a wide geography. You know, there's a case to be made spring by the numbers. Yeah, my colleague, Dr. Horvath shared with me that, you know, in the fungicide world, there's a, uh, a thought of, you know, pick your favorite NASCAR drivers and then, you know, you can associate those to different uh, fungicide mode of action groups because all of our uh, chemicals, be they fungicides or herbicides, um, are put into different groups based on how they work, and those groups are given numbers. So it's really an issue of spraying by the numbers, right? Find something that you can remember the numbers by, attribute that to the product, and then you can make that as an easy kind of metric in terms of remembering that Roundup is a group nine, uh, for example. One, two punch programs uh, can also work. You know, these are defined as basically uh, two shot programs. Uh, most commonly, this is gonna be a, a pre-emergence herbicide application in fall, followed by some sort of post-emergence treatment in spring. Uh, this is gonna be useful from a resistance management standpoint in that if you have plants that survive that pre-treatment, we can control them and prevent them from setting seed uh, on the post side of things. Um, and then, you know, if this idea of perennial poet in the South tends to uh, get a little bit more traction, obviously that could be a way to help mitigate uh, issues pertaining to that being a hurdle in control. On greens, I would tell you that if you have efficacy of, of ALS inhibitors and CURB, uh, you want to do everything that you can to preserve that efficacy because when you lose one of those tools, uh, our options for control become quite limited really quickly. Um, and we're exploring some kind of novel use patterns with older chemistry that, that maybe could potentially lead a 24C label. I think we're at least a year or two uh, away from having anything close that we would put forward for consideration uh, for 24C labeling. But um, just want everyone to know that at UT, we are trying to look at some older chemistries on the ultra dwarfs. Uh, as tools for POA management, uh, and this will continue uh, throughout 2020 and 2021. That's my final slide. I see the chat box here. We've got uh, a number, at least, of alerts. I'm going to try uh, to speak through some of these questions now. Hey, uh, yes. There was one that come in in the question and answers. What would be a good program for pole control in Bermuda green surrounds bordering bent grass greens? Okay, and that's a great question. And it is a common question, uh, particularly in East Tennessee. So I think the logical, um, the logical option is to look at, uh, first and foremost, folks look to Roundup, right? And that's what's been done for a while. And where it becomes complicated is when we have glyphosate resistance issues evolve. Um, you know, that's one where you could move into glufosinate, for example, around those complexes. But again, that's a single mode of action. Now, if you don't have resistance, rotating over years with glufosinate and glyphosate is a way um, to break that selection pressure and give you control. Um, we have had really good success in our trials with uh, freehand, as I shared, and that is something that I would have no hesitations uh, putting around bent grass greens. Couple of things to keep in mind with freehand, that's a granular herbicide, uh, and it's a pretty fine sized granule. So uh, the application can be tricky, particularly uh, in scenarios where maybe you have aggressive contouring around a bent grass green. Um, you know, right now it's, it's, it's pretty much applied via drop spreader. One of the things that we'll be testing in 2020 and 2021 is, well, could we, could we make liquid freehand, right? You know, if we think about what's in freehand, it's, it's pendimethalin, uh, the active ingredient in pendulum, and it's dimethetamine, the active ingredient in tower. 
could we get the same control if we were to spray uh, a mixture of pendulum plus tower at the same timing? I think that's an interesting question. I think it could help with use. Uh, and it's something that uh, Greg and I are gonna target this fall for sure. Moving on, looking at the chat box here. Hey, uh, go ahead, Greg. I got another one that come in in a question and answers about non-chemical control for POA. Okay. I might want to expand on some more. Sure, and that's that's a topic of interest. Um, you know, I, the, where we've focused most of our time has been with uh, phrase mowing uh, as a mechanical POA control. Uh, my PhD student, Devin, who's on this call, um, she has kind of been our lead on phrase mowing work for POA control. It's been sports field based because when we think about the nature of what phrase mowing does is it tends to make uh, things somewhat planar uh, by coming in and, and, and physically removing uh, the uppermost part of the canopy, be that uh, our uh, stolons and above ground biomass and letting things recover from rhizomes. We have seen pretty substantial reductions in annual bluegrass from summer phrase mowing. So coming into a Bermuda grass site in say the middle of June, uh, aggressively phrase mowing, letting that turf recover by fall, we come back, we look at annual bluegrass infestation in spring and we see really good reductions from that. Um, and it's been interesting to us as a program that uh, the reductions that we're seeing in Bermuda grass are actually more pronounced than what we originally saw when we started to uh, look at phrase mowing as a tool for Bermuda grass management in zoysia grass at our research farm. So, you know, with, with everything going on in 2020 and a lot of, a lot of locations maybe having less play than they're used to in the sports field world, this could be the year to try something like that out. Uh, to get aggressive with phrase mowing as a mechanical POA control. As we get into, say, the golf market, for example, phrase mowing has use on tees because tees are flat. Uh, we haven't really quite figured out yet as a program how to uh, address this from uh, a contoured land standpoint. You, know, you think about fairways and areas like that. I have some undulation. Um, we're not sure how to make it fit in that scenario, but it's an area for future work. We've also looked at, let's call them natural products for POA control. That's been um, something we focused on this spring. The idea is that some of those natural products that we use, be it horticultural vinegar oil uh, or, or things like that, they can be injurious to desirable turf. And our thought was we could put these in uh, a dormant situation and then we don't have to get it, we, we can mitigate those injury issues uh, fairly nicely. So we looked at that. Uh, Devin, my PhD student, kind of led uh, one of our undergraduate workers uh, who was an undergraduate uh, honors thesis candidate at the time, uh, Ben Pritchard, uh, through a project looking at natural products for POA control. Um, as we hypothesized, we were able to uh, mitigate the injury concerns that we had. Um, we used Fiesta, uh, horticultural vinegar oil, in several different, one of the things with these natural products is that much like we have with synthetic herbicides, you can see the same active ingredient branded under different names. We tried to get kind of a width and breadth of what was available. Uh, and we did not see really uh, good effectiveness on annual bluegrass, but what was really interesting, uh, particularly with the uh, iron-based products is that many of our problematic winter annual broadleaf weeds were controlled very nicely. Uh, the site where we did the work had uh, a really nice infestation of annual bluegrass, but it also had uh, hairy bittercress and chickweed and henbit and dead nettle. And we saw really good responses on those uh, winter annual broadleaf weeds. So that is definitely an area uh, for future work for sure. Uh, great questions. I'm gonna try, we've got a minute or two left here to um, go through some that came in chat that we haven't touched on um, yet. Question here about overseeding, uh, particularly in lawn care. Um, and obviously that is gonna limit what um, 
we can do from a pre-emergent standpoint, right? Because if we're going to put pre-emergent chemistry down to try to uh, prevent a uh, annual bluegrass seedling from germin germinating, that same uh, annual bluegrass, uh, that, that same mechanism is going to affect seeded establishment of tall fescue or any of our other cool season uh, grasses as well. So that that's an area for more work uh, in a warm season turf grass system that's overseeded, uh, you know, there is labeling for barricade before overseeding ryegrass, uh, where we can come in eight weeks before our overseeding date uh, with a barricade application. I believe it's a little bit of a reduced rate uh, of barricade at that time, and it's positioned far enough in advance of our overseeding that it doesn't compromise that establishment. And then once we have maturity of that ryegrass, we can come in if needed with another uh, rate of barricade to kind of give us sustained control moving forward. We haven't looked at this in research, but one of the things that Greg and I have talked about as a potential project moving forward is whether or not that same mechanism would be true with tall fescue. Uh, when we think about ryegrass sensitivity to herbicides, just kind of as a general rule, uh, they can be more sensitive than our fescues. And that's that's a potential area for more work moving forward is, could we take that barricade program that was designed essentially for ryegrass overseeding on golf courses and put it into play maybe in a um, tall fescue lawn scenario? One of the options that you would have in a tall fescue lawn scenario now would be tenacity. Uh, if you were to look at a tenacity label, tenacity is labeled for annual bluegrass uh, suppression pre uh, and it would have utility around tall fescue seeding. So if you are managing lawns that you know have uh, heavy annual bluegrass pressure, you want to try to do something uh, to uh, mitigate that at establishment or at fall overseeding, if you will. Uh, tenacity could be something that you could incorporate around that. Um, it would be uh, uh, something that's definitely worth consideration given the, the safety around new establishment kind of scanning through here. Um, Greg has done a really good job looking, uh, answering some of these questions via text. The last question I can see here that um, I'll touch on is about the recording of today's session. So uh, today's session is being recorded and that recording will be posted to the Tennessee Turf Tuesday site that you use to register. So uh, within the next uh, probably 10 to 15 days, you will see that recording go live. We're working with our Office of Information Technology to not only post the recording uh, to the website and to YouTube, but to add closed captioning to it uh, as well. So once that process is done, we will post it um, to those platforms and we will uh, alert everyone through our social media channels uh, that it is there and that will be the same uh, process that we will use uh, for every one of our Tennessee Turfgrass Tuesday webinars for the duration of this year and it's important to note that pesticide credits will not be awarded to archived viewing uh, of those videos they are only awarded to those uh, who view and join us live. The one exception is going to be with GCSAA credits. GCSAA does allow uh, credit for archived viewing. Uh, you can see on the screen, this is our uh, event approval code for today's uh, webinar. And this will be in the video uh, because I've shared it here now. If you watch this video on demand for archived viewing, uh, you'll want to, when you submit your credits to GCSAA, um, list the original event date, not the date at which you uh, viewed the archived video. I think that does it for now. Again, I'd like to thank our presenting sponsor for today, PBI Gordon, for their support in helping making this uh, webinar freely available to everyone. I'd like to thank everyone for listening to today's uh, webinar and participating in our first Tennessee uh, Turfgrass Tuesday. I know that we look forward to doing this uh, for the duration uh, of 2020 and using this digital technology to reach all of you. 
And thank you for listening. And we will see you on the first Tuesday of June. Have a great day.